and uh, um, uh, so uh, I would like to introduce to you uh, Dr. Rohani, who is from the University of Georgia. Uh, today, Dr. Rohani will be talking to us about harnessing dynamical footprints to detect disease imaging. Dr. Rohani, you have the floor. Thank you so much for asking to do this. Thank you so much. Thank you for the kind invitation. I'm delighted to be here and talking to you today. Um, I've got um, uh, a number of collaborators. I will uh, show you the, um, their pictures soon enough, but the main people I want to mention are um, um, Toby Brett, who um, is a postdoc with me, and um, my friend and collaborator, John Drake. So um, given the predicament that we find ourselves in, um, it's um, no surprise um, to say that um, um, understanding emerging infections and re-emerging infectious diseases um, has assumed um, uh, great impo importance in the past year. So this is um, a somewhat old figure that's depicting um, the uh, number of emerging infectious diseases um, here in uh, red and a uh, number of re-emerging infectious diseases, predominantly um, drug resistant uh, pathogens. And as you can see, this is a, uh, a, a global um, issue rather than located to any particular population. Even before um, the um, COVID pandemic, um, using um, pipelines such as ProMed and looking at um, reports of infectious diseases that were um, of concern locally, we see that throughout the world, there were a number of infectious diseases that were um, becoming um, increasingly alarming for the local population, including obviously outbreaks of Ebola in, in Central Africa, um, resistant um, E. coli infections, measles has been re-emerging, um, uh, dengue has been spreading um, in parts of the world and so on. And we understand in terms of disease emergence uh, for a number of these infectious diseases, we understand the underlying ecological drivers um, that um, lead to emergence. But what we really would like to know is um, how we might um, anticipate and predict um, the next potential pandemic. And for that, we need to think about the um, the different stages involved in um, the spillover cycle. So we're really thinking about um, zoonotic infectious diseases. So things that are um, infecting um, non-human primates, um, livestock, for example. And um, um, we want to understand uh, the um, transmission dynamics among these um, reservoir populations and amplification hosts, so civet cats were amplification hosts for um, SARS coronavirus one, and pangolins have been implicated as being potentially amplification hosts for SARS coronavirus two. And so there's a lot of work that's being done uh, in terms of um, molecular diagnostics to detect what people call wildlife chatter, uh, sorry, viral chatter um, in. Uh, um, wildlife and livestock systems so that we can anticipate, for example, stage one leading to stage two, which is limited localized human-to-human uh, -human transmission before, for example, um, the spread um, globally and the emergence of a pandemic. So, um, uh, as I mentioned, I'm not, re I'm not going to talk about this first stage um, because um, it's uh, beyond my expertise. I'm not really going to talk about um, what is it that allows a pathogen to become pandemic. But what I really want to focus on in the stage two is thinking about um, whether we can understand um, emergence risk from this localized um, transmission patterns once that spillover is taking place. This is not restricted, this, this idea is not restricted to um, novel infectious diseases. We also have um, vaccine preventable infectious diseases um, such as mumps. So these are data for mumps from the US. 
And um, we see that in the pre-vaccine era, um, notifications for 100,000 were, were high. Uh, as vaccine coverage um, increased, uh, there was a decline in, um, in incidents in the US. And then we have this re-emergence of mums with an outbreak in 2006 and some other um, outbreaks in uh, university campuses uh, more recently. So we have re-emergence of these vaccine preventable um, infections. And um, you know, we have uh, the potential um, risk uh, as a result of evolution of infections such as um, H7N9 avian influenza viruses, which cause these annual um, out outbreaks associated with live poultry markets um, in China. And uh, given the size of this outbreak in 2017, um, there was concern that um, the virus might acquire um, uh, the potential to infect humans. And given that um, across this uh, time series, we're, we're looking at about 1,600 confirmed cases and 610 deaths, which translates into uh, about 40% um, case fatality. Um, naturally, um, uh, being able to predict um, whether the virus is acquiring human-to-human -human transmission is going to be of important uh, importance to us. So, um, ultimately, um, as this paper by uh, my colleague John Drake uh, and Barbara Han uh, depicts, what we and uh, policymakers want um, is some kind of an early warning system, uh, very much akin to um, uh, weather uh, systems, where we might have um, a category which is watch. We uh, have surveillance sites across the globe, um, and we're monitoring different um, different uh, infectious disease systems. We might have um, a warning about a potential increase in, in uh, transmission or, or spillover in a specific population. And obviously we would like some kind of an emergency um, mechanism whereby we alert uh, the, um, um, more broadly about a potential um, serious outbreak. So this was the motivation behind um, a grant application that uh, we put in. Um, this is our collaborative team. Um, the PIs were from the University of Georgia, Penn State, and the University of Michigan. And um, as you might uh, imagine, most of the, the hard heavy lifting and uh, hard work was done by uh, trainees uh, on this uh, project. And I'm going to predominantly focus uh, my efforts on and work that's been done uh, in collaboration with uh, my postdoc, Toby Brett. The basic um, idea is whether there are features in surveillance data, there are statistical features in surveillance data that we might use in order to anticipate the emergence or re-emergence of uh, an infectious disease. Despite differences in underlying mechanisms for emergence, the different ecologies that may lead to, um, uh, the different mechanisms that may lead to um, waning of vaccine-derived immunity or evolution of the pathogen or, or whatever the reason might be, are there some generic features that we might take advantage of? So right at the beginning, I want to um, uh, put a disclaimer on there that I'm really not talking about um, infectious diseases like Ebola, uh, SARS coronavirus 2, or MERS, among others, because these are infectious diseases that are human transmissible when they spill over. Right? So uh, predicting their emergence is tantamount to predicting the spillover event which um, I think at the moment we can identify risk hotspots, but um, predicting the actual event uh, is uh, beyond our capability um, at the moment. So I'm not talking about, uh, about these infectious diseases. What I am talking about are emergence or re-emergence events that are due to uh, the approach to a tipping point in a mathematical sense. 
So we want to know, for example, whether there are shifts in population immunity. That could be because of waning of vaccine or infection-derived immunity. It might be because of antigenic evolution. It might be because of type replacement, which I'll talk about later. It might be due to susceptible dynamics, secular trends in birth rates or vaccine coverage. And it might be to do with um, a host adaptation. Clearly, all of this uh, relies on understanding and quantifying um, um, the transmission potential of an infectious disease. This is routinely done um, by using the basic reproductive number. And um, as I'm sure um, most people on this call are familiar, we, we use this um, R0 quantity as a measure of that. In this particular case, if this index with an R0 of three on average, each infected individual infects three other people. And so over time, we have this exponential increase in, uh, in disease incidence, uh, as we've seen with um, COVID-19. So the, the basic um, premise of this work, here's a, uh, this is a simulation uh, that I'm showing. And in the simulation, um, um, R effective, which is R naught corrected for the uh, susceptible population, um, starts pretty low and this green line and it's gradually increasing. And at some point here at time zero, R effective hits one. So it exceeds the threshold for um, um, maintaining the chain of transmission in the population. And in blue, what we have are um, a simulated um, incidence data. So these are uh, square rooted monthly cases in the simulation with some underreporting. And you see that um, there are some smattering of cases. This has got a, a, an immigration term in it. There's a smattering of clusters of outbreaks through time and um, about a couple of years after um, this threshold has been exceeded, we see um, a large epidemic um, in this population. So the question is, can we actually anticipate this large outbreak um, using some uh, statistical features of, the, of this time series here? And um, better still, can we anticipate this outbreak with enough lead time so that uh, um, control measures can be uh, put in place? Um, another way of illustrating this, um, and in fact, is that it's oftentimes easier to, to show this phenomenon using um, the approach, the bifurcation from uh, a loss of herd immunity, so kind of a re-emergent event. And in this uh, situation, we're simulating um, a situation where uh, there's vaccination and vaccination coverage um, starts in the 93, 94% range. And so the, the effective reproductive number, this R effective quantity is uh, below one. And gradually there's a decline in vaccine coverage until about year 15, where our effective hits this threshold of one. And so if we look at the monthly incidence data associated with this kind of a phenomenon, we find that there's these kind of, um, um, again, this kind of noisy um, clusters of, uh, of outbreaks, that, of cases that we see. And then about a few years after this threshold has been reached, um, we see a, um, an outbreak. So there's a phenomenon called a bifurcation delay. Now, if we use these data to the left of this um, R effective equal one line, um, we, can, we can calculate, for example, the autocorrelation of this time series and find that well, below, well before this threshold is reached, there's a noticeable jump in the autocorrelation uh, of the time series. So the question becomes, um, is there a reason to imagine that these um, statistical features of the data might in fact predict uh, the approach to this bifurcation? And in this particular case, um, this is happening in year 10 and the outbreak's happening in year 20. So 
uh, in this particular case, we would uh, presumably have adequate time for um, uh, um, lead time for control. Um, there's a number of, we've published, our group has published a number of papers on this. Uh, I'm not going to go through um, um, any of these in much detail, but I want to mention that we have a review paper with, um, with, with the entire group that talks about how um, on the y-axis, if we change uh, the immunization level, this is for um, uh, an SIR system with um, measles-like parameters on R0 of around 16. Um, we find that uh, above some critical immunization threshold, prevalence is zero. And as we go, um, as we uh, drop below this critical immunization threshold, prevalence increases. The system's underdamped uh, uh, below the threshold and overdamped above the threshold. And we can see that if we look at the potential function um, for this uh, linearized SIR model, that um, perturbations rapidly decline um, towards the asymptotic state um, away from this uh, critical threshold. At the threshold, the potential function is quite flat, so perturbations decay very slowly. And um, as the system moves away from um, the threshold, so as vaccine coverage uh, approaches, say, 90%, we get this kind of damp, we get these damped oscillations, and the potential function becomes um, steeper. We've worked out um, um, analytically a number of these um, moments and um, correlation functions for um, an SIR type system. Um, so we have um, analytical expressions for um, what these quantities are, um, um, estimators from, uh, um, from data, and a relationship between the estimator, between this quantity and, uh, and R0, which is uh, uh, obviously of, uh, of central interest to us. So to show you what these look like um, in uh, in some uh, in a model, um, here we have um, R naught on the um, x-axis, and um, these are uh, R naughts increasing from zero uh, to two. And on the y-axis, we have a number of potential candidates for um, statistical features that would be used in an early warning system. And it shows you um, the relationship between um, R naught and a particular function. So in this case, for example, the correlation time. And in red, we have the analytical um, um, prediction of that um, uh, statistical quantity. And in blue, we have simulation results for, for um, models of different population sizes. So as the population size um, increases, uh, the agreement between the analytical prediction um, increases. And the important thing that I want to emphasize here is that um, the relationship between um, R0 and a number of these um, statistical features is quite different. So um, uh, in some cases, the relationship is, is roughly linear. In some cases, it's flat, uh, approaching the tipping point. And in some cases, uh, the relationship is um, hyperbolic. So one might imagine that these uh, different uh, features would have differential uh, information to provide um, about the approach um, to um, um, this bifurcation. And there might be uh, some maybe more sensitive, some maybe, maybe more informative than others um, in this endeavor. We've looked at a number of um, a number of aspects of this. So, for example, what happens when the uh, system is subject to seasonal forcing? A lot of the uh, surveillance data that we might routinely use are subject to um, um, aggregation in time. So, here you see in black um, daily case counts in your simulation. These data might be aggregated into weekly counts, which would be uh, in blue, and in, in addition, they would be subject to um, reporting error, which is what uh, the uh, pink lines look like. 
So we've examined how, how that affects uh, our ability to detect um, tipping points um, and um, uh, disentangling trends in reporting uh, versus trends in, um, in R0. And what happens, and the fact that this, this um, critical slowing down phenomenon is not a uh, straightforward property of only simple systems. Um, so we have uh, looked at models that are um, agent-based. So you may be familiar with the FRED model from uh, Pittsburgh, but also um, MPLEX from um, Alex Vespignani's group at Northeastern. So um, to um, cut to the chase in terms of um, uh, our central uh, claims, um, we wanted to do, uh, we wanted to uh, operationalize the, uh, an early warning um, system. And in order to do that, we needed to train on some um, simulated data. So what we did was um, we uh, are going to, I'm going to tell you about 10,000 stochastic simulations of an SEIR model. And we looked at um, uh, 5,000 simulations where there was disease uh, emergence and 5,000 simulations where there wasn't. And to implement this, we used the Brownian bridge. And in this Brownian bridge, um, R0 has an initial value. So R0 goes from an initial value to an end value. So um, R0 of capital T is the um, uh, ending value of R0 in a time interval, uh, capital T. And um, W of T is a um, Wiener process and um, alpha tells you about the curvature of this random walk. So for instance, um, in this top panel, we are looking at um, some um, realizations of R0 where it starts below one and ends uh, at the same point, but in between takes a random walk. So there are times when it goes deep um, in initial in, in unique realization. Sometimes uh, there are some um, notable excursions around this um, mean value. And if we look at the um, um, incidence data, we see that there are, it's characterized by noisy and, um, and small scale um, clusters of um, epidemics. In our um, emerging um, situation, all of our um, simulations end up with an R naught of one at uh, time zero, and but their initial uh, starting values are different, and de depending on the value of alpha, we either have this kind of convex increasing function of um, R naught, which we may think roughly as maybe uh, a pathogen that's sequentially acquiring mutations to become increasingly better adapted to the host, or we could have this kind of in blue, these kind of concave looking trajectories, which may be more akin to uh, perhaps uh, uh, waning of uh, immunity in the population. And so we see that in the uh, reported cases associated with these um, uh, R0 profiles, we have um, increasing uh, um, um, outbreak sizes through time. And although some of them, depending on which of these trajectories we're looking at, some of them have had outbreaks um, earlier. So the, this, uh, this, these 10,000 simulations um, uh, represent unique stochastic realizations that uh, we use to train the model. So what we can do now is um, to look at uh, the moments that we, we um, discussed uh, a few minutes ago. As you can see, we're, I'm, we're, I'm going to talk about variance, autocovariance, autocorrelation, correlation time or decay time, the mean index of its dispersion, coefficient of variation, skewness and kurtosis. On the y-axis, we get, we're going to choose um, um, a threshold for each of these moments. And um, at that threshold, we're going to quantify um, how well, um, how accurately those uh, um, uh, 
does our method predict um, an emerging uh, trajectory correctly? And in the x-axis, we have the false positives, uh, which is like probability of a false alarm or one minus the specificity of the test. So on the y-axis, we have sensitivity and on the x-axis, we have one minus the specificity. And um, the threshold uh, you can find, in this case, we've used a, a, um, a genetic algorithm and you find for, for the variance, for example, um, um, you, the best threshold is in this um, kind of a top left hand corner. And then you um, quantify how well the classification works by um, calculating the um, area under the curve which is a probability that the classifier will rank a randomly chosen positive instance higher than a randomly chosen negative one. And what this um, diagram shows you is that the threshold and the performance of the algorithm is a function of how far ahead you're trying to predict. So if, you have, if your forecast horizon is zero weeks or even a year out, um, uh, the AUC is quite good. And if you're looking at about three years out, the AUC is less good because there's less area under this curve. Now, one of the things that you notice is that um, there's quite a lot of variation in how well um, these early warning uh, signals perform. So there are a number, for example, autocovariance, variance, and the mean that do very well um, when it comes to short-term um, classification. There are others like kurtosis and skewness and coefficient of variation that really do um, um, quite a bit less well, irrespective of how far um, ahead you're trying to predict. Um, but they're also differentially sensitive to your forecast horizons. If you look at the index of dispersion and the mean, the mean does a lot better when it comes to uh, uh, the um, either the instantaneous or a year out um, lead time. But when it comes to three years out, the index of dispersion and the mean are performing comparably. So um, these early warning uh, indicators by themselves are probably not going to be um, effective in uh, building a robust um, early warning system. So we wanted to know whether it's possible to use this idea of transfer learning, where we're going to train a model on simulated data and hope that there are generic features that it, it has in common about an approach to a critical transition that we might use to detect uh, in real data. And the idea is to improve um, our class, class, classification um, algorithm by rather than looking at a single early warning signal, we're going to use a weighted sum of n early warning system uh, signals. And in this case, n is going to be eight. So we're going to use um, a weighted sum of these um, early warning signals x. And um, the um, um, and we're going to come up with a um, an early uh, a measure of emergence risk, which is this D of T. So it's a function of time, and it's a um, it has a logistic relationship with um, this um, weighted sum of um, the early warning signals. And we're only, I mean. There's no a priori reason why it should be logistic. Um, we used it for pragmatic reasons because then we can use uh, logistic regression um, straightforwardly. So one challenge is to become the, uh, to identify the optimal weights to assign for each warning signal at each time point. Um, and so we used a lasso regression uh, with uh, an L1 uh, penalty. So um, I can, talk about um, the pipeline that we've used. So um, as I mentioned, we've got um, unique, 10,000 unique stochastic uh, trajectories for a number of parameter values, such as um, 
under reporting probability um, and um, population size, for example, we used, uh, or the initial value of the R0, we used um, uh, a Latin hypercube design to sample uh, parameter space uh, efficiently. We have some trajectories in purple that are emerging and some trajectories that are not emerging in green. Um, and uh, we simulate these trajectories. Um, for each of them, uh, for each of the time series, we calculate um, early warning signals through time using um, uh, an exponential windowing uh, function. Um, and um, so uh, this is meant to illustrate, for example, that a number of these indicators are getting stronger or greater in, in intensity as we approach uh, the bifurcation. Um, and we're then interested in plugging these um, time-specific um, early warning signals into that um, um, weighted sum that was our emergence risk, which we then um, fit using this logistic regression. So that gives us the weights for each of these um, early warning signals as a function of time. And so we're then left with a coming up with a threshold for this um, composite measure DT above which we believe an emergence is going to take place. And that's obviously going to be a function of how far ahead you would like to know about the emergence. The less lead time you have, the better the performance of the model and um, the different the threshold is going to be. So we're going to have a um, identify the detection threshold to minimize uh, classification error, weighting equally type one and type two errors here. So what that means is we put for um, any time series, we calculate our early warning signals, we give them these weights, we calculate our uh, emergence risk measure, and in this case, for the first six years, the emergence risk is uh, below the threshold, and the final four years is above the threshold. And so we say, four years out, um, this uh, trajectory is going to um, is going to emerge. The, the, it's going to um, um, there's a risk of emergence associated with this uh, trajectory. So having got this, the panel on the right then is how we would uh, implement an early warning system for any time series data. We calculate these quantities. Um, we uh, use the weights from this fitted model to uh, simulated data. And then we look at the emergence risk. So um, what I'm going to show you now is using the same approach, but only looking at a single um, early warning um, signal uh, in and of itself. And um, as I mentioned, this AUC is a measure of how well the classifier works. Um, 10 years out, or as the data are beginning, um, the AUC score is 0.5, so it's as good as flipping a coin, uh, or no better than flipping a coin. And um, as we get closer and closer to the bifurcation, there are some early warning signals like ketosis or the index of dispersion that really don't improve in performance all that much. Um, coefficient variation, um, at least for our data, for in, the, in these data, actually gets slightly worse. And there are others like water correlation um, that uh, improve in performance. Um, but even at, uh, um, at the bifurcation point, we're looking at slightly over 0.8. And 0.8 is meant is a general rule of thumb um, for, um, for uh, having a, a, a respectable um, classification scheme. So we then looked at um, what happened when you, um, um, I have, uh, I apologize, I have um, missed out one figure that shows when we have um, the combination of this weighted sum of these um, early warning indicators, 
that um, our, um, our scheme becomes a lot better. And, um, um, and so I'm missing that slide, I apologize about that. We did a, um, a test of how sensitive um, our combination is. So surprisingly, if we look at, if we go back to this figure, surprisingly, we find that um, ketosis, coefficient of variation, and um, skewness don't perform well generally as um, on their own as early warning signals. Um, there are a number of others that perform much better, like um, autocorrelation, for example, and mean. But in our composite um, um, detection um, uh, emergence risk uh, model, um, we find that skewness, ketosis, and coefficient variation actually have the highest weights uh, by some distance. So to, to look at that uh, more carefully, we look to see what happens when you include all of these eight signals um, with the weights that we have and you drop one of them out. So if you drop skewness, you, your AUC drops the most. If you keep all of them but only drop ketosis, your AUC drops the second most. If you keep all of them and drop coefficient of variation, your AUC um, drops the third most. If you have all of them but drop one of these um, features, there isn't much of a hit on the on the performance, the classification performance of your algorithm. So this is um, looking at um, a lead time of three years, which is why um, the actual AUC values are um, especially high. On the other hand, if you include one feature, um, and then you end up with a skewness uh, giving you the best AUC, and then if you add a second feature, then the feature that gives you the most uh, increase is going to be ketosis. And third one is uh, coefficient of variation. By the time you have these three in your algorithm, the inclusion of other uh, uh, features uh, only very marginally increases um, your uh, classification ability. And one of the things that's interesting about these three um, features is that they're all divided by the mean. And so um, in some sense, the population size is um, scaled out of these features. And so whether we're working with incidents or raw numbers uh, um, becomes moot. So um, I've told you about this, this pipeline that we've trained on simulated data. And now we're going to take the weights of the time-specific weights for the early warning signals, um, that we're going to calculate from real data from the fits of the simulated data. And we're going to take the threshold that we have from the simulated data from the model fitted to simulated data and apply it to um, a real time series. So that's why it's, uh, it's transfer learning because we're hoping that um, the model will, will uh, classification ability of the model uh, applied to simulated data will transfer to um, real data. So um, our first example is mumps uh, in England. Um, vaccination against mumps led to um, uh, inclusion of mumps in the MMR uh, in the late 80s led to a um, drastic decline in uh, mumps incidents. There was local elimination for a few years. And um, um, this panel on the top shows um, uh, the um, MMR coverage at 24 months. So initially it was quite high. Um, by the time we get to 1998 and um, Wakefield scandal, there's a drop um, in MMR coverage, which is um, then followed by um, a substantial mumps outbreak in 2005. Uh, Public Health England um, furnished us with um, data from, um, from England according to uh, different uh, local authorities. So each of these um, little red um, um, areas is a local authority. And then we have these regions, uh, the borders of which are I'm shown in this green line. And then I'm going to show you what happens when we aggregate the data at uh, um, the national level. So just so that we remember what the national data look like, 
um, I'm going to uh, show you what happens when we look at data from England um, only. And uh, I'm going to stop, um, my, my time scale here stops at 2005, which is when this big outbreak um, takes place. So initially there was very little um, by way of um, mumps in the England data. Our um, emergence risk shown here in black um, is below the threshold. The threshold is shown in the solid cyan colored um, line. And we find that um, sometime around the year 2000 for the England data, um, our uh, emergence risk crosses a threshold um, and um, there's an outbreak in the data in 2005. If we look at um, one of the um, regions of England, region five, um, because they were worried about um, identifiers, um, we um, don't know the exact locations of each region. So we are working with a, um, an arbitrary numerical scheme of, of numbering regions and local authorities. So region five, um, initially um, in the early um, period when vaccine coverage wasn't as high uh, as it eventually achieved, our emergence risk uh, measure is above the threshold, but then drops um, for this um, uh, decade or so and then actually in this particular region, um, we exceed the emergence risk um, some seven or eight years before the actual outbreak um, in 2005. In a local authority, so we're now going down um, to higher resolution data, we find um, that again, our emergence risk is low pre-emergence um, pre and uh, there is, um, it goes above the threshold uh, and stays above the threshold um, sometime in the mid to late uh, 1990s. So a long time in advance of, um, uh, of emergence in this population. Um, there's something interesting uh, in this issue of spatial aggregation. And I confess that certainly I don't understand it well at the moment. It's something that we think uh, we're working on. Um, if we look at uh, the data from England um, and using a general mixture model um, to classify local authorities as those with a big outbreak versus those with a small outbreak, um, our classification scheme does well in not um, claiming that the local authorities with um, small outbreaks were going to emerge. And um, from 2000 onwards, we find that uh, an increasing fraction of local authorities that experience a large outbreak are actually detected as being above the detection threshold. And for the whole country, as I mentioned, the year 2000 is when we hit the, the threshold. So we um, use simulation to um, simulate a whole bunch of um, stochastic simulations are independent of each other. So they're not spatially coupled. And we find that there is some, some measure of consistency with uh, England and Wales data. Um, but um, I think because of, because of the fact that our model doesn't include correlation structure in some sensible way, we weren't trying to ca capture it, but we do find that again, there is signal in the stronger signal, maybe in the aggregate, um, aggregated data um, than there is in the smaller um, pop, uh, populations. If you have any thought about um, why that might be, I would be interested in, in discussing that with you. But I do think that the issue of um, what's the correct spatial scale of aggregation of the data that contains the most information from the very small populations being very noisy to very large populations being in some sense more deterministic, it would be an interesting, um, interesting problem to understand better. And I say we're working on that, but I don't have a, a good explanation yet. Um, there are a number of other case studies that we've looked at. So um, measles in California, we know about the 2015 um, outbreak. And if we um, apply our algorithm, we find that sometime in early um, 2014, 
um, the um, emergence risk threshold is exceeded um, using our model. Now, I want to emphasize that the mumps data and the measles data are using the weights and the thresholds from the simulated data um, that we train the algorithm on. So they're not being fitted in, in retrofitted in, in any sense. We looked at a bubonic plague outbreak uh, in Madagascar. Again, the, the time scale of this is now much shorter. We're talking about days rather than a couple of years here. Um, and again, um, we find that well ahead of the epidemic, the emergence risk uh, threshold is exceeded. We looked at a vector-borne infectious disease, um, dengue. Uh, these are data from San Juan in Puerto Rico. Um, so the, there are four serotypes of dengue. Dengue one um, kind of disappeared from this population in the year 2000. It wasn't around for a long time until it, it was eventually reintroduced in 2000, uh, late 2007. Um, our algorithm uses um, uses this kind of information, the size of these kind of small clusters of epidemics as a, uh, an empirical estimate of the state of the system. So we need to have these introductions, small epidemics, so that the algorithm can uh, quantify the state of the system. So when there is no data, um, the algorithm uh, assigns a zero emergence risk. And so here there was, there was no dengue and then it was introduced. And so there was a big outbreak. So we don't have, um, we, we cannot anticipate that um, using the, um, this approach. Something similar happens with dengue four. Again, it goes extinct um, in 2000 in Puerto Rico. And then um, there's an outbreak in 2008. Um, and again, in the absence of, of um, uh, frequent uh, introductions were not able to detect what's going on. In contrast, dengue three, um, there are kind of these um, spluttering chains of, uh, of transmission throughout this time period. And um, before this big outbreak in 2008, sometime in late 2006, maybe 2007, um, our algorithm exceeds uh, the detection threshold. And um, we have um, a similar phenomenon with uh, dengue 2 that before um, a year or so before this 2006 outbreak, um, we uh, exceed the, the emergence risk threshold um, in the model. So the final um, case study that I want to very briefly tell you about is um, an emergence risk that is not driven by drop in vaccine coverage, um, and um, um, changes in, in herd immunity, but instead it's driven by, um, by evolutionary mechanisms. Um, you may know that um, Streptococcus pneumoniae um, has 92 identified um, serotypes. Uh, conjugate vaccines have been developed that contain seven, 10, 13 of the most virulent um, serotypes. And uh, the rollout of this vaccine has inevitably led to serotype replacement. And this is work that we've been doing with Dan Weinberger and Stephanie Pernicario um, from um, Yale. So um, there are um, uh, serotypes like serotype 14 um, that was included in the first generation of vaccine, the PCV7, the seven component um, conjugate vaccines. And we see there's lots of transmission of the, uh, of the bacterium in this population, the roll out the vaccine. And after a while, we get uh, a decline in uh, monthly cases associated with the serotype. Um, there are other serotypes like serotype one that are included in PCV10, but not PCV7. And so uh, the rollout of the vaccine of PCV7 in 2005 leads to an increase in, in incidence of, uh, of uh, serotype one, but the rollout of PCV10 then uh, knocks it on the head. And um, we also have uh, serotypes that are in uh, PCV13. And in this particular case, there seems to be um, the vaccines not working 
um, well against this uh, serotype 19A. So even in the vaccine era, there are um, seasonal outbreaks. Um, uh, there are seasonal peaks associated with this uh, serotype. And we have serotypes that are not in the vaccine. And so um, they've been having um, um, a reasonably good time in the vaccine era as uh, there's been opening of this uh, competitive niche with uh, the rollout of uh, the vaccine. And as you can imagine, uh, given we have 92 serotypes, um, we have a bunch of uh, serotype specific data and um, so we've been looking at whether we can predict, for example, for some of these serotypes that are not in the vaccine um, when uh, emergence takes place. So serotype eight, serotype nine, for example, um, um, even um, a year or so after the rollout of the PCV7, our um, emergence risk uh, measure exceeds the threshold and so we would we would sound an alarm at that point, uh, well before the um, the uh, additional uh, vaccines are introduced. For one of the serotypes seven B, there are so few cases again that our um, algorithm doesn't work. Uh, our detection algorithm doesn't work particularly well until there's some sustained chains of transmission. And um, so in this particular case, we don't get much of a lead time. So um, I'm going to uh, wrap up by saying that um, in the actual, in, in the paper, the paper is not in review, it came out earlier this year, um, we talk about emergence of pertussis, which took place over, um, uh, over a decade and a half in the US, for example. Um, I've shown you data from mumps in England that took place over, the emergence, re-emergence took place over a 15 year period. We have a few years that, um, um, a handful of years that relate to the, um, say, Dengue 2 um, um, re-emergence in Puerto Rico. And we have the plague in Madagascar where uh, it took place uh, very rapidly. So we've kind of gone from decades to years to months to days. Um, um, and the same uh, algorithm that was fitted to those initial simulations that I described at the beginning um, of this talk um, uh, is able to um, uh, predict uh, with some um, uh, some confidence the um, the emergence uh, uh, of uh, reemergence of these infectious diseases. So there are a number of things I want to um, I want to highlight. So one of them is our measure of emergence risk um, isn't uh, an indicator of um, how big that outbreak is going to be or how soon the outbreak is going to come. So as yet, we haven't been able to come up with a way of relating this emergence risk measure with how much of a lead time we're getting. Um, it's really just a quantity that is uh, predicting whether the system's approaching um, this bifurcation uh, or not. The size of this outbreak naturally is going to be um, determined by other factors, for example, how big the susceptible pool is. So in summary, we're trying to figure out um, theoretically motivated um, early warning systems. So in this case, the theory comes from um, uh, critical slowing down. The approach that we've adopted is mechanism agnostic, so it doesn't matter whether it's waning immunity or, or um, um, drop in vaccine coverage or um, evolution, for example, um, and it's independent of the details of, uh, of any particular model. So we're not fitting a, um, an epidemiological model to the time series data, it's, it's, um, it's model uh, independent. So it um, utilizes information contained in, in statistical moments and correlation functions of the data and uses um, learning to identify a decision function. And, um, in, and I've shown you all the examples that uh, we've applied the algorithm to, and it seems to work um, reasonably well in, um, 
in uh, in the examples that uh, that we've uh, considered so far. So there are there are lots of things that we need to think about before actually operationalizing such uh, an approach. So, for example, as I mentioned, what's the right spatial um, scale of aggregation of the data? Um, it would really be nice to be able to say something useful about how much of a lead time we have to say, well, it's exceeded the threshold, but I can't tell you when the outbreak is a few months away or a few years away. Um, I would imagine as a, if I were a, a decision maker, I would find that uh, frustrating. And one of the things that we've done is we've waited uh, in the absence of any other information, we've waited the costs of um, a false positive and a false negative um, equally. Whereas there are lots of situations where you don't want to miss an outbreak, right? So, um, um, whereas, you know, if, if, if you overreact, um, then um, the price of that might be um, lower. So we, there are some decision theory considerations that need to go into this. And that is associated with cost of um, dif potentially uh, differential costs of false positives and uh, false negatives. And naturally, if you um, penalize uh, the, the risk of a, a false positive, then that reduces the lead time. So there are, um, we are um, encouraged by the performance of, um, of this model, um, but recognize that there are um, uh, important theoretical advances that we still need to make uh, in terms of something about the timing and the size, the size of the uh, impending outbreak and um, important um, um, decision theory related um, components of uh, operationalizing. For example, should we um, weigh false positives and negatives equally or not? So with that, I'll um, thank my collaborators and funders and I'm happy to um, answer any questions. Thank you so much for the great talk. Um, but it was really interesting. Um, this is a time okay. where we need to channel our efforts to pandemic preparedness, given the number of pandemics that have occurred. Um, I really want to appreciate you for this great talk and timely talk. Thank you so much. Thank uh, you and then, a question there from the audience. Hi, first of all, thank you for the talk. Very interesting. Um, so we have a question by Professor Ern, but I'm not sure if he's already, um, if he left. So um, I will ask the question for him. So um, he wants to know if you have any ideas about the mechani mechanistically motivated um, warning, <clears throat> sorry, early warning um, signal criteria. Um, so I'm not sure if I fully understand the question, but I wonder whether, I mean, part of the problem is in those um, in those early stages, um, as we're see imagine the mumps example, for example. Um, so we're looking at, um, if I can just find uh, one of the times. So imagine that we're looking at um, this period, um, this period here, right? So we have some, um, um, a moderately increasing trend in uh, in cases. Um, so the question is, what we could do? Uh, one approach would be to say, um, why don't we fit something like an SIR model or some such um, into uh, to these data and um, explore whether there's a, a real trend in R naught, for example, um, in that data in those data. And so we have actually looked at um, um, using likelihood ratio testing, where you formally test whether a model with an increasing R0 performs better than a model with a flat R0. Um, so that is an approach that could be adopted. Um, but I think the strength, the relative advantage of the, of the approach that I've outlined, uh, outlined here is um, now that we've got the algorithm, all we've had to do is 
we have this pipeline, we feed in the time series data, um, in this case, months, and we look at the, uh, the emergence risk measure through time and see whether it exceeds the threshold. When our disease system changes, uh, for example, as we were looking at um, the bubonic plague in Madagascar, we just put in a new set of data. We don't retrofit anything. We don't, we don't worry about, no, this is now, we need to think about what the fleas are doing and what the seasonality is doing. And so the, um, I see the absence of mechanism in this approach as a virtue rather than um, a limitation. Thank you so much for the answer. Um, in line with uh, David's question, um, I was curious to know, because when I look at these area warning signals that you used, the statistics that you used in your machine learning algorithm, um, they all rely on R0, and this R0 will be based on pre-existing characteristics in a particular country. So I'm curious to know whether your group is looking at those pre-existing country characteristics that will be able to be used as, that we can be able to use to inform R0, then in such a way that if we know this pre-existing country characteristics, resources can be directed towards those particular characteristics such that we address them before we ever have an outbreak. So are you looking at those to identify those that can be able to drive these statistics that you are using? Um, so, um, so we're not actually looking at R0. Um, we used R0 as a proxy for um, simulating disease emergence in a mechanistic system so that we could train the algorithm right so the only thing that the only thing the algorithm is using so if you if you look at i don't know this point here our algorithm is using an exponentially decaying weighted um uh, windowing system to look at what let's say the mean incidence has been over the past period of time and it's using and it that in combination with the weighted um, variant, uh, index of dispersion, uh, and so on, are the only quantities that the um, the algorithm is using to uh, to come up with this emergence risk and see whether it's above the threshold or not. So we we used R naught in order to inform the model as to what those, how do those statistics change as you approach a bifurcation? But then from then on, we're only using those statistics. And so in this particular case, for example, in region five, um, our algorithm would tell uh, the local authority, the public health authorities, you know, many years before the outbreak that it appears that we're about to, um, we're going to hit uh, a bifurcation point. Thank you. Sure. Um, thanks a lot. Elena, any other question? Thank you. Um, Looking in the chat, there is no question so far. So if you have any question, just feel free to um, use the chat panel and we will ask the questions or you, know, you can ask the questions in person. So um, I'm actually, I have a question in the meantime. So um, you use general data for the population. There is no structure in your models, right? So you were yeah. not expecting that any structure, which can be social or age structure, will somehow give different um, signals. Um, in, in, for example, in, in the sense that maybe if it's a childhood disease, I would expect that maybe more, most of the cases will be, you know, in, in among children. But we know that for measles, for example, even teenagers or young um, adults are having, you know, I experience in the infection. So is this something that you are um, thinking to include or? Sure. It is something that, um, so it's possible that um, by, um, we might have to wait, depending on the on 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 the infectious disease system. Mm -hmm. It might be um, advantageous to wait our um, early early warning statistics by age as well as by time, mm -hmm. right? Okay. So that, as you say, we might get the most information out of a specific mm -hmm. uh, group of uh, of uh, popul of, of the population. Um, 
And that's something that we're looking at, especially in the context of the strep pneumo system, where, um, um, again, children are uh, bearing the brunt of, um, of cases of uh, strep pneumo. Um, but um, I think what it's so one question is possibly our, our, um, our classification accuracy would improve mm -hmm. by targeting specific age groups. Um, and that is something that, that we are, um, we're looking at. But most of the data that we have for um, a number of these systems tend to be aggregated cases. So we've gone with, okay. um, with the kind of the ignorant situation of not knowing uh, the breakdown by age uh, mm -hmm. for a lot of these systems. Okay, thank you. And oh, sorry, um, I have um, another question. Oh, no, sorry, Jude. Oh, go, on. go on. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just related to that because we know that, for example, for um, I, I worked on measles, so um, I know that there might be some mild cases, right? So the data that you are using, there will be all the confirmed measles or mumps, um, but there was you, you're not keep, keeping into account the I will say somehow the unreported. Um, cases or maybe misdiagnosed cases, right? So um, I know it will be hard to get data on that. So working on that, sure. but um, so your is your um, you know your results somehow um, they will be affected by these unreported or you know people with waning immunity and so not showing the symptoms. Um, sure. One of the things um, that I didn't have time to go into um, was. Um, the fact that, so, so first of all, we trained our algorithm on simulated incidence data. So the, the data were underreported, but they are also uh, subject to reporting error. So okay. it's called ballistic and underreported. Now the question is whether, you know, did we have the right distribution? We assumed um, like an overdispersed uh, mm -hmm. reporting error. And is that the right thing to do? Should we do something smarter? But there are, um, those are questions uh, to which I don't have a good answer right at this minute. Um, but in, in, in this paper that uh, I'm highlighting here by um, Toby Brett, um, we looked at uh, what happens when you have reporting error to these early warning signals. Um, and in this paper here by um, Eamon O'Day and uh, John Drake, they looked at whether you could actually tell a difference. If you're seeing more cases, could it be because that you're getting better reporting rather than uh, more transmission? Okay. And, um, and their observation was that um, you can tell these apart because the better reporting will affect some things like the mean and possibly the variance but it doesn't affect other things like longer term correlation uh, and higher order moment of the, of the time series. So, um, so you've identified an important question. Um, I, I am encouraged that I think our approach seems to be reasonably robust to that. Um, but we could, it could be even better if we had um, a clever way of addressing um, disease specific under reporting. So you're, you're quite right about that. Oh, okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sure, of course. Thank you. And then do we have a question there from the audience? Um, yeah, so we have one question from Sung Mok um, asking um, if the early warning signal can work well uh, if the R0 of the disease is highly um, over dispersed. Um, So um, that's an, an interesting question. I don't, I don't have a trivial answer for that. Um, I think if the some if the mean R zero uh, in the population has a trend in it, um, then I think I'm going to claim the the approach might be okay. Um, but I'm I'm purely speculating. But that's a really good question. Thank you so much. Um, so, um, because thank you so much again for this interesting talk. There are a lot of questions. I myself will be following up with other questions. 
Sure. Um, uh, we want to thank our audience for being with us throughout the semester. And because this is the last talk, I'm going to give the floor to the director of the Canadian Center for Disease Modeling to actually appreciate you guys how much uh, the CDM appreciate the time you have devoted to be part of this family. Thank you so much. Over to you, um, Professor Zhu. You're muted. You're muted. I <laughs> wish. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thanks, Jude. Uh, first, like, uh, thanks, Professor uh, Rohani, for this very interesting talk. Also, uh, this has been a very special year. Uh, for this series, we have four uh, presentations. Thanks all the speakers for the four uh, lectures. Uh, I would also thank uh, Jude and Elinda, the representing Center of Disease Modeling, organizing uh, this uh, fantastic uh, lecture series. Uh, indeed, this year is not really uh, easy. The pandemic is still going on, so we are going to continue uh, 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 next year. Uh, so the holiday season is coming. I hope everybody would have a very safe, uh, wonderful uh, holiday and Happy New Year. We will see all of you uh, next year. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Happy New Year to everyone. Thank you so much. Thank and you. Happy New Year. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. See you in 2021. Thank you. Thank you.